Hey, everybody. Look who it is. Diamond from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project. I'm Rex Bear. How the heck are you? It's a beautiful night out here in Southern Colorado, and this is going to be a quick discussion about some amazing petroglyphs that we're going to go look at in Crow Canyon. And also, we're going to talk a little bit about this squatter man, just some information that I recently connected that I feel there is a connection there. And I want a diamond to explain the squatter man for those of you that haven't heard him explain what he believes it is, because it's fascinating. So Diamond, I really appreciate you being a guest on Leak Project, and I appreciate being a guest on the Oppenheimer Ranch Project. What's up, man? I just blurred my background. <laughs> I see that. Cool. Well, it looks good. Looks good. Yeah. So what's been going on, man? The squatter uh, man. Got my, I put my squatter man on for the show. We, we're, uh, we've got a petroglyph tour coming up the last Sunday of May, hey, hey, in Crow Canyon. Can you believe it? It's going to be awesome. There's so many different options for investing right now. A lot of people are getting a little overwhelmed. Are you one of those people? Well, if you've got your money in the bank, not so great. It's losing value every single day. So check it out. Gold is unstoppable. Have you been watching the numbers with gold just for the past seven years? Look back over 20 years. The stock market, is there a single stock available that was available 2,000 years ago? No, there's no stocks on the stock market that were around 2,000 years ago. Guess what? Gold was. Gold was around 6,000 years ago. You can call Noble Gold Investments right now. If you want to get some gold, you want to get some gold, you want a free gold coin, convert your 401 or IRA through Noble Gold Investments. Real simple. Call them up. Let them know Rex from Leak Project sent you. Get a free ebook if you go to leakprojectgold.com. How to get out of the rat race. Ebooks that'll help you and your family and help protect your assets. Now, obviously there's never any guarantees. So what do you do? You look at what the big banks are doing. Noble Gold Investments has an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Tons of five-star reviews. Give them a call. 1-877-646-5347. Let's get back to the podcast and be the change you want to see. So we were just there and we did a recon tour and we went out there a few years ago and equally blown away this time. I mean, we actually connected a few more dots. And I wanted to talk about a couple of the panels that I find very interesting. Some of these panels appear to have X's that we've seen on other panels, like in Utah, and I've seen them in Arizona, and we've seen them in New Mexico. And I've heard different theories about these X's, but you brought up something I think is a good possibility. I was, I was hoping you'd bring it up again. I have no idea what you're talking about. Possibly Vikings putting those X's over all the other petroglyphs. Oh, they're cross. Yeah. Well, the petroglyphs in Crow Canyon are much more recent than any Viking uh, visitations. These are from the 17th century to present. The majority mm -hmm. of them, a yeah. lot of the uh, weaker glyphs are older underneath. And I think when we go back there, we need to really take time to, to look. It was like the last, when we went to the uh, 44 panel area, that we noticed when we were looking at the fresh glyphs that there were older glyphs they drew right over. They drew hunting scenes over older hunting scenes. So the hunting scenes we're seeing are from the 1800s that the Navajo are, are pecking in there, but they're pecking over older scenes. Now, the air, this region is the center of the Dinata or the Dinate or the Dine people. And these are a group of natives that moved from east of the Mississippi into the Southwest uh, 2,000 years ago. And there were the largest group of Native Americans there, and they interacted with all of the other groups, which they claim there were dozens, uh, like the cliff dwellers that we're familiar with, the Puebloans, those were the largest groups, and uh, the Anasazi, all different people. And people blend them all together as one group. So the, the Navajo are the original Dinate, which is the largest group of natives that came from the east into the southwest 2,000 years ago. And they hold the most information still today about what all these petroglyphs mean. Uh, now, what I find interesting is that a lot of, because I did a lot of research in the last uh, week or so uh, with, with the elders of the Navajo clans, and they have explicit uh, 
information on what each of these panels have. So if you come on the tour, we're going to be describing to you explicitly what each of all of the panels mean, the, the more recent glyphs, because I've uh, been researching that and I've got it all written down. So when we go from panel to panel, I'll be able to tell you what the corn seeds mean, why it's significant to the Navajo people, why they have, you know, the first panel we found, the main panel with the seeds that are slowly sprouting and they get bigger. And then there's the full corn stalk. There's a meaning yeah. to all of that on that. And then we go on that, in that same area, we get to the third panel. It's seven bow and arrows. And underneath of them is seven hourglasses which the hourglass is the most prevalent petroglyph in the entire Crow Canyon. There's, I think, almost 800 of them. And it it's because it, it is it, the simplest representation to the Navajo of the, uh, the hero twins, which is their creation myth. And the hero twins and the compound bow are directly related, which is why you've got seven compound bows on that panel and seven hourglasses below them. So when we go back there, knowing this information now, we've got to then reinterpret what we're seeing there. So the hourglass is the hero twins myth, which is the creation myth of the Navajo. You, you know what I'm talking about, the hero twins, correct? Vaguely. Yeah. So we should uh, do a little more research on into that so that when we're looking at these panels, we can understand what we're looking at. I think it's a great idea. And also, I wanted to mention- Oh, also, you know the triangle head man yep. on the third panel with the-, with beard. the, with the and the and the horn guy. We, there's one panel with four different types of horn guys yep. in different directions. That is a, the hunchback. Uh, the Navajo have a, have a different name for Kachina than the Hope. The Hopi and the Zuni have Kachina. The Navajo have the Yeti. Have you heard of that? I have not. The, the Yeti is their gods, so they don't have Kachinas. They have Yetis, but. But it's language to language, word to word. So when when we go talk to the Zuni people and they say Kachina and they wear the masks to represent the Kachina, which is their gods, in the Navajo culture, they have the Yehi, the Yehi. It's not the Yeti, it's the Yehi. And the Yehi is their gods. And it's represented with a, a geometric triangular mask. So when we're, or a square mask. So when we see the robot guy, the very last Petra, remember him? And we see that also in San Cali. That's also Dinate. And then we see the triangular man with the with the thing and the horn guy. The horn guy is a specific god. It's a specific hunchback yehi, which represents fertility and the spring planting. So on that main, this one panel that we'll see, which is the biggest panel in the main panel area, which is actually the buried panel where there's a figure coming out of the ground with the big horns. That is the hunchback Yehi, and he is the god of fertility and spring and corn. And was that and, the one that I said I thought might be a demon? Yeah, that's the that's actually one of their nicest gods. Cool. That's yeah. A, so which is weird. Color. Why would it be? Oh, it's it's a mountain goat. It's a mountain goat horned hunchbacked Yehi. So I guess the mountain goats return down into the valleys. Or into the desert in the spring when they plant? I don't know. Uh, or that's where they are. Who knows? Well, I got to look more into it. But but th that specific horned deity is very specific to the Navajo. It is the hunchback Yehi, which represents uh, the fertility god of corn and all that it is. Well, that's really cool. I also think it was really neat when we went out there and we saw the 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 stories that were being told like as you just brought up the seeds it goes from a seedling to an actual crop and then there were some very now one of the panels that i found fascinating but unfortunate because it reminded me of a scene where there were some colonizers that were yes. attacking the locals yeah, so this natives. is the whole point of Crow Canyon, bro. Yeah, and Crow Canyon is recent. It's from the 17th century. The or, or the or the glyphs that are the most prominent. The canyon has probably been ceremonial for you know twenty thousand years, thirty thousand years, you know, all the way back to the first people pecking on the rocks. But the 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 impressive thing is the most recent glyphs that we're going to see, which are the most prominent ones. We're also going to see some older ones. 
but the whole point of this canyon is to record the history from the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And what's happening now? It's the white man. So it's not what we interpret it as being Spanish people. That's probably not it. It's the white first white people coming out there and the wars they had. And at the same time, this is the hats what, look French. I just wanted to throw that out there. The right, hats look so French. So we're, we're gonna have to look into that because maybe the early first people, the explorers that came out there, had those hats on, like Lewis and Clark type people. But the the point is that I want to bring clear here is that we did not subjugate that we didn't steal the land from the Native Americans. The Native Americans were stealing land from Native Americans before we got here. So it's not like we did it. They were already killing and warring from groups and stealing their land for tens of thousands of years. And people don't get that. So when they say we have to give it back to them, ooh, there were like 75,000 different tribes years before we got here. It's completely weird. Well, it seems to me like it's all a part of this conditioning uh, of non-understanding it's confusion it's uh it's like a copy and paste you know we go to school the indoctrination the education they teach us something that oh okay well they know what's happened now so we've got it all figured out we don't have to worry about it it just makes it easier right it's it's very interesting it's confusion yeah. tactics to me like the real we're gonna get we're gonna get bulletins like we're gonna see the boards of communication the internet from the 1700s <laughs> We're going to see information that was etched in stone because it was so important and not misinformation. We just have to yeah. interpret it properly. Right. And so what's cool, yeah, what's cool, cool is that we we went to a few Pueblitos a couple of years ago on the south side of Navajo Lake. They're like totally perfect. The wooden floors are in there. Remember we crawled, we got video inside. Oh, Those yeah. were built in 1820. Those were strongholds to fight the white man. That's what they were for. And so in this Crow Canyon, we have evidence of these stronghold pueblitos, but they were built before the first white man was there, which begins to question if they already have these defensive areas deep in these remote canyons, they were already fighting off a threat from the Ute or the Hopi or some other group before white people got there. And it just so happened when the white people got there, they were in a perfect position to... to <laughs> they came into the canyon because they're up on the lip perfect view they saw them coming the whole time and then when they get there they're like hello look at that um you know what else i want to I want because to look we, when we're at the main panel the first pueblitos behind us you can stare up at that cliff which is a thousand feet away all day and never see it you're right you, you're absolutely you could right just be like where is it like you can't see it. It's that good because it's the same rock. They just built up into a little little tower. Now, this is the one out by Sand Canyon that you just brought up. No, we went to a Pueblito on the other side of Navajo Lake. That's which right. Which is local. That's right. And uh, really, it's the most recent one. It's from like 1820 or 40. It has wood floors on both. We went in. <clears throat> the, there's two Pueblitos here. We've never been to either of them. We've Located the one on the other side from the main canyon and looked at it with our, you know, but on this trip, when we get to panel 44, if the group is all good, it's just another 0.8 miles to get to the main ruin past the 44 panel where, where we've never been. So it will be a first experience for everyone, which is what an expedition should actually be. That's cool, man. Yeah. Have you gotten any information on the 44? I haven't gotten to that point. I, I've got a huge PhD dissertation that I'm watching on every single panel. So I'm only halfway through. I haven't gotten back that deep into the canyon, but I I suspect that they don't have an explanation for it. They look similar to the H blocks. Yeah, that's what you and I think because we've seen so much of this uh, prehistoric uh really unknown or unexplained stuff that is just explained away in stupid fashion. I don't think that's what it is. I think it's something else. I think yeah. it's something, I think it's something more modern. And also notice there was that one guy standing up with the two daggers, standing up on that animal next to it. He had two daggers. 
Yeah, it's modern. So it could be as early as the 19th century. Yeah, that's kind of the vibe I'm getting. Like, but the the what's the purpose? Why are they fours connected with L's? They're not fours. The top two fours have equal tops. The bottom fours have different size tops on the four. So they're not four fours. They're, it's something else geometric. And remember, uh, the masks, the geometric triangle faces are specific to the Yehi, the gods. Yep. yep. So this, let me get through it. I'll do the research. I'm because I'm not done. They go through every panel and I'm not at the end of the panels. Okay. So I'm sure they try to explain what the 44 panel is. And whether we believe it or not is to be seen. But so far, because they're using three elders, uh, this is pretty good information. And I can believe everything they're saying, which is nice because it ties in the last 300 years with the last you know, 9,000 years where we can start to connect the petroglyphs going back. Yeah. Absolutely. For example, let's because so let's, these recent the one the three hundred the recent ones in the last three hundred years obviously are going to reflect some of the things from the past. Of course, absolutely. Especially if it's cultural and it's these you know lineages that have been in the same area for 10, 20, 30 thousand years. That's significant. Yeah. yeah. Now, so folks, just so you know, this event is going to be May twenty sixth. It's going to be on a Sunday. It's you're going to have the time of your life. Just make sure you're in physical shape to do it. You know, you're going to have to be able to walk about five miles, approximately five, six miles, right? Yeah, minimum. So if you can't do five miles in a 10 hour period, don't even attempt this. It's going to be in three pieces. So we'll have rest between. We're not just going to go straight bore through six miles. Like we did. The first piece is like a month. Yeah, we and we explored. So we did probably 10 miles. Yeah. But the first piece is a mile and then we rest. The second piece is a mile and we rest. And the last piece is the big one could be up to four miles round trip if we do it all. Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's in an area that is quite remote. I mean, just, you're going to want to have a high clearance vehicle. You don't necessarily need four wheel drive. I don't, I don't think you'll need four. It's drive. recommended because if it's slightly sketchy or it rains at all, we could be stuck for days, weeks, or months here. So we really got to play it by ear and work on the weather. Uh, Alien Allen, in fact, got stuck out here for a, a long period of time because he got in, uh, happened to drink a couple too many beers, and then it rained two inches, which means you're there for four or five days because you wow. can't get back out of Largo Wash until it dries. Wow. Unless that's that main energy. wash that we crossed. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. And if it's too dry, like if it doesn't rain at all between now and then, it gets hard to cross. You know the how the Arizona yeah. dust. Yeah. You know, yeah. I actually made it out there in the Astro Van back in the day, and I got lost kind of, so I ended up driving through the wash for a minute. <laughs> the Astro yeah, but we'll have a group with straps and high yeah. clearance and four-wheel drive, so we'll be fine. Yeah, we'll be we'll good. We'll get anyone through it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and so, folks, you want to join us for that? It's going to be specialists limited. and CPR and everything. So we're 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 good to go here. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, like, if you want to go, you may want to get your tickets quick because I think there's already it's already about halfway filled up. So yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I would take. I'll just we'll leave the link in the video description box, and we'll see you there. It's you're going to love it. It's going to be awesome. And I wanted to talk now for just a few more minutes because I know this is going to be kind of a quickie here, and I appreciate you being a guest, Iman. So, will you give your interpretation of the Squatter Man, and then I am going to read a passage out of the Secret Book of John, which is a Gnostic text. There's only three or four originals left. This text is actually older than the majority of the texts that you read in the Old Testament. If anything, it could be older than Genesis. In well, the it Old should Testament. be. Because I think that the squatter man was first witnessed during the Younger Dryas event. So either the 12-9 event or the 11-7 event when we came out of the Ice Age, it's more likely it was the 11-7 event in my opinion, but that's a whole nother podcast. But when you and I did Squatter Man, I did a, a talk on how this would have been created, which would have been a supercharged aurora coming out of the North and South Pole highly energetic, probably 10,000 or more times more energetic than any geomagnetic storm anyone has witnessed in the last few hundred years. Why? And what? Go ahead. 
Why? Like what, what caused it? It would be a, 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 a solar storm from the sun, like an X 200. So the energy comes in, then the aurora you get is not just like a couple lights or dancing things. You get this guy that emerges above the North Pole that is literally um, the highest energy form of the plasma column. Now, before you get there, you get other iterations of this. And a lower version of it is the Jacob's Ladder with all those levels. It looks like a centipede. And so like you can final... see it, you can see it on this picture right here. If you look to the left of the Hopi uh, or what looks kind of like the Hopi um, four corners petroglyph, there's the la there's the ladder almost like the, what are you, what are you showing? I'm not, I don't see it behind me. If you look oh, behind okay, me, yeah. my screen, that's the, that's, that's an, that's a, from a different place, the menorah. No, next to the menorah, next to the menorah is the oh the christmas tree looking thing that's yeah. dead yeah but that's not really a true jacob's ladder it's more of an absolute looking ladder like a centipede but okay. that that wilted tree is could be one of the forms but also this menorah the form changes i mean yeah. it's it's dynamic it just doesn't like go from one to the next it it shifts dynamically Right, right. And so, so from hand. this, this is the tightest version. If it weakens, what you get, it it steps out like this as it weakens, and you get more and more rungs on the ladder. Bang, bang, bang. You can get up to 11 rungs at a weak state. In a in a, a more in an, a certain energetic state or a position on earth, you would be eliminated from seeing this, which is more like what your glyph look like looks like up there. Yeah, it looks so. The further towards the equator, you're going to start to block this part out. So down in Egypt or Iraq, you're going to see more of this guy, and if you're up towards Norway, you'll see the whole guy. Whoa, that's a great explanation. Now, so as because the guy is sitting up on the North Pole, so the further down on Earth you get, the less you see of him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and it, and it and it and it looks different. So aurora up in the polar region is green and red and really dynamic. And as you come down towards southern Canada, it mutes out. It gets bluer with reds. And as you get towards Arizona, it's all red and yellow. So it changes where you're standing. What you would see. Copy that. And then, so as an example, the menorah man behind me, that's a petroglyph that's from 5000 BC that was found in Siberia. It looks like the seven Nagas to the left of it, or it looks like the squatter man on your shirt, or it looks like a menorah that the Jewish tradition uses um, as one of their symbols for their beliefs. And so what if the menorah is what they saw and it was actually the squatter man and where they saw it, it connected, maybe, maybe it connected to the planets could sense, hence the seven, the seven heads. What do you think about that? Well, you can get these forms. Uh, Anthony Pratt has produced all these forms in the lab. So you can get right? the seven tips of the squatter man. And I think that all these religious symbols, the Om, the Ankh, the menorah, the cross, the the Iron Cross, all of this comes from looking at things in the heavens. It doesn't come from anywhere else. Prior to that, we had no language. We really had no art. And it wasn't until 32, 40,000 years ago that we really have carvings or art of any significance. We've got the Lion Man sculpture. Yep. We've got Lascaux Caves and all the European caves of cave art that are quite Amazing. specific, showing us directly that they knew of astrology Thirty thousand plus years ago they knew of taurus the bull they drew it they put the stars in the painting where did they get that information exactly all of all of what is known from art language everything comes from people looking at the heavens and then writing it down on rock that's the beginning of it all it became commercialized in Mesopotamia when they learned how to make rock. They called it clay tablets. They crushed up rock, put it with water in, made a tablet, and they were like, now we can put art on our own rock. 
So this idea of writing things down on rock doesn't come from 32,000 years ago when we've got those first paintings. It has to come from eons prior. And it has to, it's all happening at times where we don't, there is no way any of that art would have been preserved for that length of time. If there's any weathering, you're not going to get any 130,000 year rock art preserved. It's impossible. So most of the stuff we can see as the oldest stuff, 30 and 40,000 years, where is it, Rex? It's in a cave where in no cave. weathering is happening. The petroglyphs date back 10, 12, 13,000 years because of weathering. Anything older is gone. And the old stuff you can barely see, you know. At the mile marker one on road G, we're looking at 10, 12,000 year petroglyphs, the oldest ones up on those older boulders. Oh, yeah. And they're almost, they were in size probably an inch and they're almost gone. Yep. So yep. that's the problem. The earth is too dynamic to preserve things for too long. You know, it, it is. And that's why I'm so glad we have a chance to go out and look at these things and connect the dots. And one of the things, so let me read this to you real quick. Yeah, let's and go into your thought. This is pretty, this is pretty powerful. So one of my favorite scriptures of the Gnostic text is called the secret book of John. Now the secret book of John is equally fascinating and equally mysterious. Um, like it talks about the archons. It talks, and people have all these ideas about what the archons are. They're like, I've heard just about everything you could think of. The definition of an archon is a ruler. So let's just go with that for a minute. Like, we don't need to look at it as like interdim interdimensional snakes from the fourth dimension. A, 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 not that kind of ruler, a, a global, a leader. A, thank you, Diamond. You always have, you You always find some way to, I, I love it. I love it. That's why I love you, brother. Okay. So um, like a, not a dictator, but somebody that controls, somebody that leads, like a, a general manager, a ruler, an archon. Okay. So here we go. This is titled Humanity Begins. And I'll just do a screen share real quick. Let me do a screen share. And remember, folks, the Vatican and the Crusade, they, they tried to completely destroy these scriptures back in the day. I mean, these things were like, no, we cannot have this because it has a completely different genesis. Every, it's it's completely because different. they love us so much. Yeah, they do. They love us. So it's called Humanity Begins. Then came a voice from the highest realm saying, the man exists. And the son of man, Yaldabaoth, chief ruler, see, ruler, archon, uh, heard it. He thought it came from his mother. He did not know the true source of the voice, the holy mother, father, perfect providence, image of the invisible father of everything in whom everything has come to be. Then it describes the first man, the first man. This is the one who appeared to them. He appeared in the form of a human being. All of the realm, the chief ruler quaked. The foundations of the abyss moved. He illuminated the waters above the world of matter. Sounds like the atmosphere, like Aurora Borealis, kind of like what Diamond was talking about. He illuminated the waters above the world of matter. His image shone in those waters, like Diamond was just talking about. The North Pole, the squatter band, like we're looking at kind of behind me here. All the demons of the first ruler together gazed up towards the underside of the newly shining waters. Through that light, they saw the image in the waters. It's not referring to the waters down here. It's referring to space. Y'all, the Baoth said to his subordinate demons, let's create a man according to the image of God and our own likeness so that his image will illuminate us. Wow. Pretty wild, right? That's what this was. He's just dancing up there. Dude, that's what I think. Yeah, so when this shows up above the North Pole, it would have been so impressive that even when the sun set, it may have been visible. And so there's a, a dude standing up there changing forms in the as you look up north, it would have it would have been beyond well, that's when the scripture comes in, right? Maybe the first scripture to exist. And the way they describe it, when we look at it, isn't easily interpreted in words to like 
physical matter here. We we really don't know what they're trying to say because they don't know what they're trying to say. Because they're like, dude, we were go- for 50,000 years, we're fine. And then we woke up and there's this electric dude in the sky all day. And we're like, hey, buddy, we love you. Don't kill us. But at the same time, it's a cosmic catastrophe. So either meteors are hitting, glaciers are melting, and floods are happening while this guy's like, <laughs> and they are like, we need to write this down somehow. Yeah. I mean, I have not heard a better explanation yet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's it, why you got what's behind you there. Yeah. I mean, the Nagas from ancient India, ancient Hindu teachings, ancient Siberia. And then look at this. In ancient Siberia, it looks like they've got some Viking runes. They've got some giants and regular sized people. And then they have what is often referred to as the Hopi shield, the four corners of the earth. And then you've got the the tree, the Christmas tree next to that. Yeah, but the weird people, the weird creepy people or the giant eye alien people, they go all the way back to 47, 50,000 years into Aboriginal Australia. It's not a unique experience. Mm -hmm. This is an experience happening all around the world, interpreted in different art, showing the same creepy weird stuff that unfortunately, you know, in the 50s through the 80s was attributed to ancient aliens but I think we're getting a closer hand on it. No, there's not, you know, reptilians coming down in their spaceships and influencing us. It's much deeper than that. This is a psychological construct of humanity itself expressing itself through art, which becomes vocabulary at some point in a way that they needed to do because it was so significant Nothing else needed to be done except to put this down on rock. When you, you can kind of debunk the just kids having fun etching characters in stone from 2000 years ago. I've heard people say, well, that's what I think it is. Well, then how come the same images are seen all over the world? And how come the bird head is so significant in ancient mythology to those that are the most powerful? And then it's literally, oh. it's literally Anthony Peratt literally dialed the plasma to the right temperature and voltage to get the bird head. And what he showed was amperage and voltage as you shift it gives you all the different forms. You can go from squatter man to Jacob's ladders to squatter man with multiple levels to arms up, down, in, out to the duck head. The duck head comes in there in a very big way. Uh, and we're seeing that duck head everywhere we go. And it really doesn't have a good explanation in the mythology of these tribes. So the Petroglyphs we can well, hold on real, real quick. The petroglyphs we can well explain from the Navajo or whatever with the corn and the triangular heads and the robot heads and their yeah, the the Yehi and the uh, Kachinas from other tribes that we know of and the elders. What we're talking about is a subset of petroglyphs that they do not describe. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. They don't talk about the squatter man and what it means. They don't talk about the the candelabra behind your head. They don't talk about the duck-headed people. But you and I know that that is described thousands of years earlier in the Egyptian texts, etc. Well, what's what I was just going to say is the most powerful deities usually are those that have a bird above their head. The most majestic, the most powerful, those that have, have ascended or like came down from the heavens, they've got a bird on their head. So that tells me that, especially if we look at the stuff in ancient Egypt that's just as old, but it's a hundred times more intricate, but it has the same, it has very similar parallels, that there's significance to that image. So maybe at that time, if they're, Maybe there was the most electricity. Maybe there was the most power at that time when the bird came out. So it is it is labeled as one of the most powerful deities in mythology. That's what's, just what's cool about Crow Canyon is that we have a form that looks just like Cocopelli that you can yeah. see. Yeah. Bird head, yeah. squatter man. We have 
Jacob's Ladder, all of the plasma petroglyphs, as well as the well explained, yeah. more recent Navajo. So this is really an experience of a lifetime. If you're never going to see petroglyphs like this in your life, for the price that you're going to pay for the day that you're going to get, you got to make your way out to Bloomfield, New Mexico. It's easy to get to. We're going to meet in the Salmon Ruins parking lot, uh, the Salmon Ruins Museum parking lot. It has 50 spots. They're not open when we're meeting. Uh, it, it's a perfect place to meet. And it's, and then from there, it's straight into wilderness for over 35 miles until we hit the main panel. Yeah, dude, this is going to be great. I'm so looking forward to it. And thanks for all your help, man. Thanks for, uh, for being awesome, dude. Yeah, let's do it. I'm going to bring my, my flute and we've got a bunch of stuff planned. We're going to have a few special guests. Uh, and I've got stickers coming. They'll be here in a week. All right. And I've got a few shirts left, so maybe I can give some shirts out. Yeah, there's more than that that we're giving out at the door. So not only do you get uh, food and drinks along the way and support from Rex and I, interpretations at all the panels that are probably the most cutting edge that anyone can give anywhere in the world. That's a uh, fact, Jack. That's yeah, a we're also going to have really cool stuff to give out to every single person that meets us on the journey. Hello. All right, everybody. I hope you have be a safe. beautiful day. Hit the bell. Be well. Subscribe to Diamond's channel and be the change you want to see. And we'll see you in the desert, May 26th. Nanny, nanny. Mm -hmm.